Gil McLaughlin, welcome to the studio. G'day, Jared. How are you doing? Thanks for having us. Is that the bit you might miss most? Um, there's lots I'm going to miss. Um, that's a long night, um, but we, you know, we all got a bit of a gift last uh, last Sunday night with it. So close with such great players, and you're certainly warm into the role up there. And um, <laughs> I just felt there was a couple of things at the end of when I was, yep, sit down. That I, you know, by then I knew what was going to happen, and I just felt that it was such an epic finish with such great players that everyone needed to be seated yep. and sit down and listen and give whoever the winner was going to be or winners that right level of respect. And um, I thought it was I thought it was an amazing night. It was, and there's something about seeing a champion of the game up there at the end. And we're going to see a champion of the game for a bit longer in Sydney with Lance Franklin signing a one year extension at the Swans. What do you think? Well, I'd heard I'd heard other things. I think it's fabulous that he's. One playing on, and he's staying with Sydney. Um, I feel it's. I feel very happy for for him and his his wife that uh, he's made this call because I feel it's going to be. Um, I feel. I, I feel. I, I don't want to get into what I think because it's obviously very personal stuff. But I feel great for the game, and obviously the Swans and for Sydney that he's staying there, playing and also staying with Sydney. What's so he had that rather lovely line today he was asked well people didn't think you'd get to the end of nine years and you're signing one more he said I've proved a few people wrong haven't I yeah um, I, I said the, in the function on um, uh, Saturday afternoon about Sydney um, they're just a, a, a great football club and part of part of it is their consistency and the, and the people and but they're in there is some boldness in their decision making. I don't think people necessarily equate that with Sydney's boldness because they've you know they've always the bloods culture and it's a conservative element. But there's huge boldness in that Franklin call. There's boldness in what they're doing to the Royal, um, the, the 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 new training admin facility going in. That's taken on a huge thing to raise that money. There, there's some boldness in the decision making. Franklin was a big part of that, and they, you know he's paid off. What's Buddy been worth in Sydney for the code? Do you think? Hard to quantify, but he. You know, it's a it's a it's a marquee player town, and they love big stars, and and he's given them that. And so, you know, what are they three sixty thousand members? The Swans, they are, you know, they're the biggest club in Sydney, and and he's got to be part of that journey in the last ten years. He's got to be part of that story, that that, that contribution. How we quantify, I don't know. Is it the best season this century? Well, I've been um, around for most of it, and I reckon, yeah. I mean, this is nothing you can touch. What's been happening? Um, you might have had. Um, Anyway, there's the little things you'd like to tweak, but uh, Home and Away finished on the last day, coming down to 0.6 of a cent and a point here and a point there in percentage. And, and, um, and you know, I was at the Sydney St Kilda game after and things hanging in the balance there and ins and outs and suspensions and then rolling into a great final series. That first week of the finals was, um, you know, highest rating ever and, you know, then we got to we had five games and furthest um, biggest margin was twenty points. hasn't happened since nineteen seventy five, and then obviously that epic on on Sad Davis we'll probably had one poor game, which is the first prelim. Other than that, the finals have lived up to the home and away. And the style of footy, it's been eminently watchable. It's it's a far cry from the game that was constipated by congestion in those worrying years. What's your view there? Well, um. Yeah, I mean, it's hard for, to be in my role to, you know, you're always wanting to be positive, but I was, I think, explicit enough in the way um, I felt it could have been better at the time. And, and Steve Hocking came in with, with obviously, the, in charge of running all the football, but his specific brief and what he was interviewed for was to come in and, and get the game rolling again and to, to open it up. And people want to say, oh, was that mean more? God? It, I, we all know now because we see it. The, 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 um, the greatness of the game... Uh, is back in the game and I just no one likes change and there's individual parts of people critical about whether it's the stand on the mark rule or the 50s or the protected area but they all come together and he sat and he did it diligently and patiently over four years and we're getting the payoff and I, I just go I'm at great lengths to acknowledge one on one the intellect and the and the way we work through it not to have unintended consequences because we get it now but 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 everything was there knowing that if we did something else, there could be consequences. So a lot of stuff was ruled out. And there are no lines on the field and it looks the same. And, and he did, it took courage to do that. So we're getting that. And I, and I think I said to the CEOs yesterday and the chairman, um, let's say Collingwood Fremantle, there was 90, 91,000 there. Now that game, I've been around a long time. That game was probably a 75,000 crowd five years ago, 
even with all the momentum of Collingham and winning all those games. But it's 91, in my view, in part, because not only have they been winning and not only because it's week two of the finals, it's because the football is so good to watch. And there's a halo about actually people, more people are going almost you know, in a way that is beyond what you expected just because the footy's so good. And they like the appeal of it. So I think, uh, you know, I, I couldn't, I think the footy's compelling and there's hardly a game where you watch where you don't enjoy watching it. And worthy of more. Did you float at the President's and Chief Executives Conference the idea of a 24th round, so a 23rd game, and potentially gathering the whole code somewhere together? Yeah, I did. So, so it came as an idea. We, we work with the clubs about how they want the season set up. And this year, if you recall, do you remember we played a – they played at some internal practice matches and low-key stuff, and then they played one proper hit out in venues with all systems going, and they just played it like a home and away game. They built it into each other, and people got suspended, people got injured, and it was like, so we had the the CEOs and presidents on the back of that just before the the opening week, and I said, well, if you're going to do it like that, why don't you why don't you play as a home and away game, and we'll just have a very limited preseason. Um, so. There was not a no, so the team have gone off and explored all of that, and now we've got multiple states interested in doing it, and it got to the point where three states say, "Yeah, we'll do it. We'll move. We'd love to have all nine games in this market. All you know, our, you know, the members in each state still get their eleven home games, and it's an additional one, and we can come together as an industry and for whether it's you know whether it's in whatever state would be, it would have a different would it have a different logic, and. Um, Yesterday, we got a tick to go and say, yeah, okay, now we can start drilling into the, you know, we brief the clubs where we're at and what it would mean in a marketing sense, a financial sense, what a logistical sense. And so now uh, we're working through that with the clubs and, you know, importantly, the footy departments also talked about the clubs there, you know, what it, what it might mean for members and others. And we'll see where we get to we'll probably do it over the next two or three weeks, but it'd be a, be a big thing. School holidays, the right window for it? I think the, 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 what they've been notionally talking about is somewhere around we get the season out of the blocks well and strong and maybe around sort of five-ish, um, second half of, of April, it's school holidays nationally and people could set it up, go away with their families and, and work around that sort of weekend if that if that was their inclination. Double headers, triple headers? Triple headers is what was sort of in, in some venues, yeah. I mean, you depending on where, but if you're in, in – um, in say South Australia, um, there's one venue really, and you'd have to really make it work. And that you know you'd have a carnival. Um, if you're in Sydney, there's a couple of venues. If you're in Perth, there's really one. So it depends on where. But you know, I think wherever you are, there's contemplation of sort of triple headers. And next season is the likely outcome. That's what we're looking at. Yeah, yeah a lot of work exciting. to do. I mean. My team have been sitting around doing not much, so they're <laughs> looking for stuff to do. All right, the, the nitty gritty. Yeah. Was is it a mistake to have music after goals in preliminary finals? Does does the game really need that? Um, it depends where you are and context. I think, like everything, the details matter. So, there's if you go to any game in Brisbane and any game in Sydney, any game in Perth, there is music all the time, and you go there and it's not jarring. We played preliminary finals. There was music in Sydney, and it was all part of the event because you know, you know, Sweet Caroline's always played there yeah. and, and stuff like that. Friday night blowout game. It was the sort of Geelong's the songs they played out in Geelong, and for me, it probably didn't feel quite right. And particularly playing songs and other stuff when it's twelve goal margin. Um, so I think you evaluate all that stuff, and uh, we certainly won't be having it in the grand final. Yeah. So. Do you know what it's based on? So uh, you're saying it works at other venues. Is I think the reaction most of the year around the MCG is, who's decided this is a good idea, and aren't we aren't we enough to make the the noise and to enjoy the ambience of it? I think yeah. There's two. There's a couple of responses to that, Joe. So we give the clubs who are the home team for the finals the opp opportunity to produce the event how like they'd like to produce it and have an input into that. So Geelong were included in that, and those songs mean something to people in Geelong, and that was their sort of playlist. Um, but we, they want to produce it as their game, like they do when you go to to Perth and others. There is this town is different though; it's so conservative. I, we were, I went to the the were you at the Fremantle final or the Geelong Collingwood final? Ah, uh, yeah, both. Yep. So the Fremantle final, you know, sorry, no, the home one. Um, oh yeah, no, we were in Melbourne. Yes. If you, so have you been going yep. to the Waves final? It's totally contextual and it adds to the energy. And this town is different and everyone's feeling it out. Um, but um, 
in the right moment, in the right time, the music does add stuff. People can't have it all. You know, when you're counting down into the last 60 seconds of the final grand final day and the music and the noise, that actually does add to the atmosphere. And I didn't think it worked Friday night, but people were always going to try and improve the experience for the, for, for the punters. It doesn't mean it always works. And I think that's the conclusion from last Friday night. But, it, but continue to try and improve. The day we stop trying to do that and be better will be one of the other sports that's not going anywhere. Friday's weather's a bit risky. What does that do to the parade down the river? It's going to be 22 and perfect Thursday, Friday, <laughs> Saturday, blue skies. I've got no issues, Joe. This is, this is the year. The weather's, not, the weather's going to be perfect. Everyone, and if we're trying to rely on Melbourne forecasts four days out, we know they're wrong. So you're committed to the down the river? Yeah. I'm going to be, you know, I'll be there. <laughs> will we, will <laughs> no, we be on no, a barge? I think I'll be in the... Now, there's an area we can watch on the side. I'm not on a barge, but I'm going to be there having a look. There's an area I think that we've got some space where we, we take some clients and stuff like that. So I don't know where that is, but it'll be, it'll, I'll be there. Why do you think this will work? Uh, you, the weather, you mean? No, or the, 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 <laughs> I can, oh God, if it's raining on Friday morning and we're down the river. Yeah, there's, there's everything that people, every form of change and everything that's new comes with incredible risk and no one likes and everyone to pile on. So it's. If it's eight degrees and hailing, uh, you know, not ideal. But I reckon the best version of that is that there is um, a quite. I reckon there could be a quarter million people there on Friday. I yep. reckon it could be epic. We need to, uh, you know, catch a break with the weather. Two days of public holidays. The build up to these, the football this year, this final series, and the just the want from Melburnians to be at the footy and around the footy is nothing like I've known. I've never had such a push for grand final tickets and access. And I reckon if there's a quarter of a million people there and people will be able to sit on the banks of the river and then as they come down and then they get into the to the um, the Hilux or the Land Cruisers or whatever they're getting into and they ride there and then there's music all through the parks, which there will be. Uh, I think it's going to be a great day and I reckon the whole thing will play out now. There's an alternate view. <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. I've got Pat on tomorrow. Is he allowed to bring his own boat? Um. Oh, danger! Yeah, sorry, I should have oh, said. Da- yeah, no, danger will have his rods. I hope as well. <laughs> um, but danger's got that sort of stage; he can do whatever he wants. Um, uh, we'll see. I think I think of the it's of twenty minutes on the river. Uh, it look different, more vantage points. Um, we'll see. We'll yeah, see. I, I don't think he can bring his own boat. No danger, you can't. Gil, how optimistic should we feel about a Tasmanian team in the 2027 season? I think directionally it's going pretty well, Jared. So yesterday was an important day. Um, we presented to the 18 presidents, I've got to say in this, um, um, where we'd got to with the Tasmanian government. Um, and obviously you know, we present in a way that I think we think that the, the deal looks encouraging. There's some stuff to do. Um, so it was sort of 10 or 11 issues. Um, we think we've got sort of a funding model. We've got a TNA model. We've got a lot of the, you know, the list build, all that stuff was all laid out for them. Um, we've got to, we've got to work through a stadium solution. There's a big, big commitment by the state government down there and they've picked a venue at Macquarie Point, which is right in close to in, in Hobart. So the clubs have that information. They're going to share it with the boards and with, this, with their boards and, and, and come back to us with questions around that. And the way that we're approaching it is, you know, it needs to be the right deal for football. We think we're going well on that front. Um, but we'll sort of, there'll be technical votes and others. We want, every, you know, this, everyone has to own this decision That's and rather than votes. And we want all our clubs supporting this because they think, they think it's the right thing for, for, for the game and for, the, for our supporters. And I think directionally that's where it's going. How significant is the last piece to get the federal government funding of a stadium? Well, we're gonna, we, we, we've been keeping them abreast, but, it, but yeah, we'll need some help to get this thing funded. Uh, it's the right point when we've got all the other tin tacks in place. If we get there, then we'll talk to, to other funding partners. And, and obviously the federal government's one of those, uh, potentially corporate support, other support. But, you know, we, we'll need some help, no doubt about that. But if we can get it right, the, the, the case will be that it's you know really makes the makes this important state sing. And that's what Adelaide Oval did in South Australia and it's what Optus Stadium has done for Western Australia. How big is the commitment from the Tasmanian state government? Are we talking a number that stretches somewhere towards $700 million over time? 
Uh, it's, it's a big number. I'll, I won't speak for them, but it, but including capital and, and operating support, it's it's big, yeah. And that shows just how all in they are. Yeah, they, they, they're, they're, they're making it clear in every sense that this is the moment for Tasmania and, and getting a, a seat at the table in the national competition. And um, I think, you know, I commend them about them leaning in on it and making making the case, both both emotively but also financially and substantively. So how wedded are you to it? Are you in the mind as I'm not leaving office until I've got this Tasmanian piece sorted? Uh, what the commitment I made to, to my chairman is that we would, I'd, I'd resolve a number of issues. Broadcast was one and that's done and Tasmanian's another. So I do feel that, that I made that commitment publicly and that's my job to do that, to run this to ground. We're about to have a trade period that I suspect will crack through a few thresholds um, as culturally we move more and more to player mobility. Could you see a time where there's a mid-season trade period beyond your time in office? Yeah, yeah, I could. Um, How soon do you think? Uh, soon. Uh, the the conservatism in no. Let's just put the envelope back. I, I um, I'm quite a traditionalist, whether people think that or not. We're still playing at two thirty on Grand Final <laughs> day, um, and players, one club players, and great players staying with their clubs is something I really do like and want to continue. So let's put that in the in the in the um, that stake in the ground. But then, when you're competing and playing, you know, it's, I, I, the, the the analogy I use is I would I wouldn't want to go into a, a year and say you have to have exactly the same staff at the end of the year. In the, in, uh, at the end of the year, it doesn't make any sense to me. All my key guys have been with me for ages, but it doesn't mean I have we don't have change and evolution in and out. And so you can have both. You can have one club players and great players staying with their club forever, but also get to the season, middle of the season, say, oh, I need I need another Ruckman or I need, you know, I'm, I'm competing here, I'll trade a bit to get a outside mid or whatever it is. It just, for me, um, greater flexibility in our list management is something that has been resisted for a long time. We pushed in the um, the mid-season draft and everyone thought it was all right. And, and now people are getting players who have an immediate impact. Yep. They've been, and, and they're, they're, just, they're in the, in the second tier competitions, making no impact. And every, well, almost to a club, there was universal resistance and now it's having a big impact. And I think the trade period would be the same. There are very good players not getting games at clubs who would make a difference to another team within a season. And it makes no sense to me not to be able to facilitate that. Do you think there's a craving in fandom for it where previously there might've been a resistance? I hope that every year goes by when, when the majority of things, you can see the benefit and they become part of it. That's just progression. You've got to do it at the right speed, but I do think that the supporters would come on that journey. I mean, this trade period's, you know, the stats is just massive. Yeah. And so trading players is all about, you know, theoretically, you do it because you can see upside. And the supporters want their clubs and their teams to get better. Now, that yeah, they don't want them to lose great players, but they don't have to trade. They're contracted. So... The theory would hold that you would only be doing a trade if you're, you're, you were improving your team, and I think supporters, fans, want their teams to get better. Talking about your guys, is there any risk that the AFL will lose Brad Scott to the Essendon coaching job? I don't know. I mean, Brad's a star, I think, and he was a great coach. So I think Essendon would be um, – I'm sure they'd want to talk to Brad. Um, um, I also think Brad's going down a different journey. Um and he's doing a very good job at what he's doing, and they're they're just different. They're different paths. He is, you know, running football for for our game, and he is every day uh, improving as a as a general manager and learning all those broader skills. As no one knows more about footy than Brad, and um, you know, at some point he'll have to decide whether the day to day brutality of coaching is where he wants to go or whether he wants a life of, of general management that gives him different options, whether they be running footy or, frankly, he could be a chief executive of a club in time or all those sorts of options. So, I'll, you know, without saying, of course I'll talk to Brad and, you know, he's he's got a job to do in the next week or so and I'll talk to him at the right time and we'll see where that goes. Yeah, so he'd need, would he need to clear it with you to talk to Essendon? I just don't. I don't, I don't even know. In a technical sense, I just feel that any of my guys, well, I, I just know – my team are being approached all the time, and I feel uh, um, that, that 
I feel good relationship with all of them. Of course, we talk to me. It's not like that. I wouldn't clear it to others. Come and say, what do you think? You know, if if, if people work with me, there's plenty of us. You should you should go and do that job. That's part of it. Our industry, you should you people should do that. Whether if it's if it's good for them and the development. Often I'll say, I don't think that job's right for you. So. Um, I, we don't operate that people get permission or whatever. They, I, I have a relationship. They come and have a chat, and well, let's say, what's what's on offer, and how's it look, and is it good for you? Because um, people have got one life to live, and they need to do what makes them happy and what's developing them. What chance Kylie Minogue joins Robbie Williams on stage on Saturday? Um, no, I don't, I don't know. I, I, okay, there's a surprise. We'll see. There is a surprise. That's all I can say. And uh, he'll be joined. There you go. <laughs> we love a surprise. Yeah. How, how big is this grand final, given that um, the Sydney grand finals do have a, a certain cachet on television? Well, the way it's going, I reckon this is a chance. I think still, I uh, might be wrong, the highest rating grand final in history was in 1996, which was Sydney North. The way the ratings are at the moment and the momentum of our game and where the viewership numbers are at, there's a fair chance this is the highest rating grand final ever. Um, the prelim, I'm still trying to find out, the Sydney Collingwood prelim averaged over 2.3 million, which is, I think, a record, the highest rating prelim ever. Um, it's pumping. So all of New South Wales lean in, all of the country is going to lean in. It's just, it's exciting. And uh, it's going to be 22 and sunny. Um, we've got Robbie Williams. We've got the best under-17 kids playing beforehand. There's um, a women's game at Punt Road Oval. We've got, we have, quarter million people on the Friday. It's going to be a great week and I hope that everyone somehow gets their footy fix over the next next week or so. So as you leave us and at whatever point when you leave the game, will, do you think you'll be emotional the day that you, you close the office door and, and walk out of the job? I've already been emotional. Yeah. People have seen that. I mean, this for me is a, you know, it's an honour and privilege to do this role, but it, it, at the core of it, I love football and I've, um, you know, I love my team and so there'll be all of that leaving, um, uh, leaving, you know, a group of people I've been working with for a lot of time in a game that I am truly committed to at every level. So, of course, but you know, um, you need to make you need to keep rolling, Jared, and keep moving. And there's other things to do. And I'll keep meddling. Them. I'll, you know, it's not going to stop me texting people every ten minutes <laughs> to tell them what I think's wrong. <laughs> they're not going to. They're not getting out of that. <laughs> but there's just no doubt. I mean, I've been. I get emotional thinking about stuff even before I was leaving, but generally, you know, I get emotional sitting there with the SCG absolutely packed and people traveling and how much joy it gives people who've driven overnight from Melbourne, the Collingwood supporters and getting there and then seeing them all sit side by side with Sydney people and stand in total silence and anthems that our having, you know, 80,000 people with the MCG and not a person say a word. Uh, while we give a moment's a minute's silence for the Queen, I mean, just the respect of our supporters, their passion for their game, and makes it just you know I think we're just lucky to be in this game, really. Gil, enjoy the week. Thanks for all you've done. Thanks for being here today. Thanks, Jared. Thanks for you know being the voice of footy at the moment. You're doing a great job, and appreciate you having me.